what is Animal and how can it become one of those before and after films that we have? So um, Animal is a film that we filmed in 2019 and the beginning of 2020 with directed by Cyril Dion. Um, and it's essentially me and Vipalang going on a mission to meet economists and politicians, activists, farmers, and they all have solutions to what's called the sixth mass extinction, which is basically the mass devastation of life on Earth. Um, and your question about before and after is an interesting one because I think often within environmentalism we see actions uh, independently. And what we need to start doing is seeing, seeing those actions within an ecosystem because, for example, Cyril's first film, Demat, at the beginning, it was, sorry to Cyril, it just wasn't a success for the first bit. And then now, if you look at lots of films which have been predecessors of that film, they have f uh, followed the model of being solution-based, being futuristic, um, being positive. And so the impact is huge and vast, but based on the first the first sort of measure of success, it's hard to say it was a success at the beginning. And in, in 2015, there was um, a case called the Juliana versus US case by 21 youth plaintiffs, basically putting in this lawsuit against suing the US government for its inaction on climate change. And the case failed. But as a response to that, there have been cases all over the world of young people doing the same and having being successful in suing their governments. So I think we kind of need to see actions as um, within an ecosystem and then in hindsight maybe in 20 30 years we can look back and say look how far we've come look how little we're deforestation how low our emissions are now um, yeah amazing now I'm gonna ask you people and what is animal autonomy uh, that's a huge question and so yeah it was more about the book that I wrote f with some two of my friends and what we try to, to say with that expression is that um, we need not only to take humans' opinion, but also to take into account the, uh, the agentivity of other animals. Uh, and that we, tr we, we should try to make society with in by taking into account other animals' uh, forms of expression that are not easy to understand, but we should do, try to do that. And one of our main proposition about uh, the, the stories maybe, is that we should not only have movies and books and stuff like that, but that we should also create what we call a material culture. It means that we should have representations, but we should also have like new practices and uh, put, put in place those practices in events and stuff like that. And that we should, and that it has a huge impact on creating representation. On creating representations, we just we don't need only stories, but also like other practices. And and I'd also like to continue with you, people. And can you see any connections to the rapid loss of biodiversity and other crises that we're living through at the moment? Yeah, completely. Uh, I, I think that I mean, as lots of people and as have demonstrated today, uh, lots of scientists and so on. The ecological crisis that we face today is because of an economic and a political system. The economic system is the capitalism, basically, because uh, we focus on just doing more and more profit, and that uh, we all our um, our society is focused on a concept which is called the economic value. I mean. Today, you, me, all the people here, a tree, an animal, everything is economic is an economic value, and then maybe it could become a, a merchandise. A merchandise. I don't know if it's a good word in English. Merchandise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, um, it's the Marxist theory of, of the value that everything is be is becoming value. So if we want to create an ecological society, we have to think without this concept of economical value but more about interdependence, interdependency, sorry, and about uh, freedom, equality, and so on. So we've, we've talked a bit about you know, the, six, the sixth great mass extinction and, and capitalism and some things that aren't exactly great. So, so Bella, what positive changes can you see happening in the world right now? So political, institutional, that kind of thing. I think what is 
really great for us to remember is that all around the world there are little fragments of the future playing out and people creating a new world that we can live in. Um, and I was speaking to Louisa earlier, who's an incredible German um, climate activist, and she's often asked, are you um, an, opti an optimist or a pessimist? And she calls herself a possibilist because you know, we're going to people and if we say to you, if we say to people that we're trying to engage, right, we have this crisis, get involved, no one is going to get involved. But if we go to them and say, look at what we have, we have all these possible solutions, we have this future that we can create and here is your opportunity to join us, come and join, that's much more likely to um, engage people. And an example is like in Costa Rica, which we um, investigated for Animal, um, they've, in 19, 98, they implemented a scheme called the PES scheme. And basically, they take money out of a carbon tax and they put it into reforestation. They reforested over 50% now. Um, their happiness rate has increased. They're one of the happiest countries in the world. And, you know, there are countries around the world who are doing incredible things. There are individuals who, ha who are implementing incredible solutions. And at the same time, there are massive systems, corporations who are wrecking the planet. So we're kind of living in a very weird liminal period where it could go either way and where what we have to do is find these individuals, these governments, these companies who are doing their best, harness everything that they're doing and imagine this better world and then use those solutions, uplift them, amplify them. Now, I often think that people's treatment of animals is like a direct reflection of how we treat each other. So I was wondering, uh, Vibulan, how can we help people see this so we can move on to live in a world that's, that's free of oppression for, for all living beings? That's a huge question, and I think that I don't have the, <laughs> the exact answer, but um, we've talked about stories, and yeah, I think that we should use like all the means that we have. Education is a strong, is a strong thing in which we have to, to involve, uh, because today in education we don't, talk about that and we focus on economic value, as I said just before. I mean, at least in the major part of education in the world. Uh, and yeah, and we, tr we should try to, to, to think the ecological fights in link with the, the workers who work in the, in, for example, in the coal factories, in, in the petrol factories, um, in the slaughterhouses, and those kinds of things, because People uh, who who work in those kind of sectors are also exploited by the by the system, which is destroying also the, the biodiversity and the living li the living life in in the in his whole possibilities. It, it's a, a great that that reflects quite well back to the the territory, the film we were talking about before, where you see the land grabbers, but you can see the the influence that's come from above them, and and so one of the reasons that that they are doing it. Now, the next question is one that is very personal to me. Now, my daughter, she's nine, um, actually barely one of, one of her top five activists she mentioned to me today. Um, now, she does a lot of work and people always say, oh, wow, she's the next Greta or something like that. Or, wow, she's inspirational. Oh, she's so brave. And often, you know, young activists are that kind of, okay, you're brave and inspirational, so you go do your talk and then we'll all feel great and then we'll move on. So. I want to know how can we move on from from young activists just being brave and inspirational, and how can we ensure that the ideas of younger generations are being taken seriously? I, it's just a really weird time where up until now in history, throughout history, um, you know, even as primates, the adults have been disciplining the kids, and we're suddenly at a time where it's like the adults are waiting to be disciplined by the kids, right? And they're I've had like politicians, people in organizations I've worked with who are sitting there and saying, okay, this is going to be a youth space. I'm going to sit back and we'll let you young activists do it. And I'm kind of sitting there thinking, like you've, you've set up this organization, you've built it up and now you're here asking us just to take it over. Um, and I think what we need is more intergener intergenerational spaces. And today, Change Now is a really, really good example because there hasn't been this division of, I've been to one youth meeting, apart from that though, there's been intergenerational panels and there hasn't, it hasn't felt patronizing in the way that um, people are sitting back and watching uh, youth spaces, I guess. So I think what we need is engagement at every level and I hope 
one of the big things is I hope this COP will be better because at uh, COP26, they had invited young people, many young activists, who were then made to sit outside and watch the proceedings on their computer. So it's a bit like, if you're going to invite young people, don't make it tokenistic, make it deep engagement. And maybe about that. Uh... <laughs> Don't clap because I'm young. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe about that, in f at least in France, we often talk about the, the generational fracture that young people are more committed and young people are more concerned about that. But for me, uh, that's not true because, I mean, in young people, some, some people want to work for big compa companies like Total and stuff like that. And some people are committed. And in the same way, uh, in all the generations, uh, some people are, are committed and some are not. I mean, I think that we are not in the same generation. No, no we're not. I, I might look young, but you know, I am, I'm not actually Gen Z. But, but we, we, we try to, to commit both, uh, both of us. So the question is not really the generational fracture, but the social fracture. I think that if we look, for example, who is creating the, the logics of uh, exploitation, of oppression, of alienation, it is a social fracture and not a generational fracture. It's so true because, you know, at home at the moment, in, back in Spain where I live, there's my, my nan who's 88 and she's the person who's most obsessed with not wasting water in the world. There's, there's my parents who are, are both vegan and my dad is the most obsessed with anyone I've ever met about solar panels and solar energy. And then there's my daughter as well. So it's clearly, you know, th there is the, that consciousness across generations it's not just okay young people want to change so let's let them do it you know there is that consciousness and we do need to to bring them together but i'd like to know so for all generations out there looking on thinking how can i be like vipulan how can i be like bella what what would you say to them um i really doubt anyone's thinking that because honestly i haven't i've never met an activist or a campaigner who is perfect in the sense that we often imagine. So we imagine this sustainable future, this utopia, and we need to completely abolish this idea of perfection. Um, I think more than just being damaging to us as individuals, we all know if, if you hold a really high ideal for yourself, you're not going to live up for it. It's also impeding our progress, I think, environmentally and as a society, because we need to accept there are solutions out there, there are solutions which we, we hear and then we kind of immediately disagree with. But right now, there's this thing called cathedral thinking, which is that we start building the foundation without actually knowing what the cathedral is going to look like. And that's exactly what we need to do, because we can't sit back and wait for a perfect, ideal, utopian future. Um, you know, people are proposing things, some governments are doing things, some are doing nothing, and what we need to do is latch onto the thing, the solutions which are being proposed. Excellent, and what do you think, Vipulan? Uh, I think I do agree with what you said, but uh, yeah, the, the, the purpose is not to, to become like somebody uh, who, is, uh, who has some attention in media and stuff, but trying to, to, to have impact and trying to be efficient on the way you, you, you fight against, uh, against and for better, a better world, in a way. Now, you, you were both activists before the film, obviously, because um, otherwise you wouldn't have been selected for the film. That would be kind of strange. But how has making the film like, pushed you forward and, and given you, I don't know, has it given you more confidence in what you do, or how has it changed your direction? I was just very cynical before the film, I think. Um, <laughs> Cyril came to me. I was doing a lot of campaigning about uh, animals specifically. I very rarely looked at the human element. I kind of just hated humanity and everything we were doing to the planet as still a, you know, little, a little bit there, colonel. Yeah. Um, but I think when we were doing the film, now I've learned one of the big lessons is before I was trying to reach people um, through the issues and now I kind of try and reach the history through human element and through using people's stories because we were meeting all these individuals who had incredible stories and also realizing what you discussed earlier about how intersectional it is and you can't really extricate one issue without looking at many other issues 
Um, so I think the biggest thing I learned is, first of all, um, actually, there's a really great quote by Mary Hegler, which is, we shouldn't be over, just overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem. We should also fall in love with the creativity of the solution. So one big thing is focusing on the creativity. Um, and then what I said earlier about perfectionism, I think. Amazing. Vivulan, how has it changed you? <laughs> how has the film changed your view on, on activism? Um, you said in the introduction when you presented us that uh, I was an ecological activist. And I think that that's an important point. Uh, for me, um, I would say that, in a way, both of us uh, moved from an environmental perspective to an ecological perspective, uh, which means that for environmentalism uh, is, in a way, uh, think wanting to protect a nature which, is, uh, which does not have humans inside, uh, which is essentialized, and which is, in a way, um, accomplice of the, of, the eco of the actual economic system which thinks that nat nature is only a, an exploitable value, you know? And in a way, uh, in the idea of environmentalism, we also have sometimes the idea of uh, fighting against climate change and fighting against the biodiversity loss is um, more, maybe it's more important than other fights. But in fact, lots of people are dying and are oppressed because of other other causes. Like we talked about capitalism, we can talk about like racism and patriarchy and so on. And the thing is that uh, I don't think that environmentalism is a um, is a way of thinking that uh, that tries to, to, uh, to, to think the world with, just, with real justice. Um, and compared to that, ecology is historically first a science, a science that tries to, to understand the relations between living beings, but also between living beings, beings sorry, uh, and the, the environment in a way. So ecology as a fight is a fight to um, rethink in a way and also act other other forms of relations that are liberating uh, both towards uh, non-humans but also humans so one final kind of question now watching the film I, I took an awful lot away from it and I felt a huge amount of positivity um, after, you know, after it finished. I was just like, yeah, there are solutions. There are things that we can work for. I was wondering, how do you hope that this film will inspire other people of all generations, of all different backgrounds? I really think that um, most people are fundamentally quite good. And um, I think the problem is that we're all we sort of kind of believe in the story that our government tells us. And um, it happened in America, what Donald Trump told a story, hate the man, but told a good story about make America great again. And humans believe in the restoration story. And what we need to do, I hope people take from the film, is that we can each create a different narrative, a different type of restoration, um, which is, what I talked about earlier, so we're going to go to people and give them not a crisis, but an opportunity. And we are living in a crisis, um, but it can also be turned on its head and used as a chance to create a much better world, a much more amicable society where we're more compassionate, where kids can play in the street because there aren't as many cars, where we have stronger communities, less air pollution, more biodiversity in cities. Um, and I think that's something really beautiful to look forward to. And all of the people that we met in the film, yes, they were overwhelmed, they had had moments of burnout, but they also, they kind of had this big belief in this vision and in this future. And I just, if anything, hope that people take away from the film um, that sense of vision and possibility that we're kind of treading on, but we need to just grasp and follow, chase, yeah. I don't think that ha I have something to add to it. No, nothing to add there? Amazing. Um, 
Well, thank you both very much. You are not only inspirational and brave, you're much more than that. Um, so thank you so much for coming along today um, and sharing your ideas with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.